Okay. It is now seven o'clock. I will uh, call this meeting to order. Good evening, members of the board, colleagues, families, and our virtual viewing audience. Noting that there is a quorum, I call this Bloomfield Board of Education regular meeting on November 9th, 2021 to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America, United States of America, and, and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under, under God, God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. for all. Thank you. Before we begin, the first order of business. Please join me in welcoming our new Board of Education member, Joseph Wilkinson, and congratulate our returning board members on their re-election. Our first order of business, business is to appoint officers for the Board of Education. I will provide, pre preside over the election process until a new board chairperson is designated. Then the elections will continue under the order of the chairperson. At this time, I would ask for nominations for chairperson of the Board of Education from the floor. Mr. Don Chair. Harris. Mr. Chair. May I make the following motion? It is my honor to nominate as chairman of the Bloomfield Board of Education, Donald F. Harris Jr. Second. Donald Harris Jr. has been nominated for chairperson of the Bloomfield Board of Education. Are there further nominations for chairperson? Hearing none, I declare the nominations closed. The bylaws state that where there is but one nominee for an office, the election can be held by voice. Is there any objections to this procedure? No. The following individuals is present for election, Donna Harris Jr. for chairperson of the Board of Education. And Kristen will do a roll call. And I would ask for those in favor say yay. Kristen, would you do the roll call? Um. Femi Bogle Asagai. You're muted. I'm sorry, yes. Yeah, okay. Lynette Eastman. Abstain. Howard Fryman. Yes. Donald Harris. Yes. Robert Ike. Yes. Thomas Moore. I abstain. Joseph Wilkerson Jr. Yes. The yes, the yes have it. Okay. Congratulations. You have elected Donna Harris Jr. Chairperson for the Bloomfield Board of Education. Congratulations, Mr. Harris. I yield the floor to you. To, uh, Thank you. So that you can proceed with the election of the remaining officers of the Board of Education. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. And I thank all of you who have uh, given your support for me to uh, continue as chair. Um, at this point, I'll entertain uh, nominations for the position of vice chair of the Board of Education. Howard Friedman. I would, I'm sorry. Okay, Mr. I. Howard Friedman. Howard Friedman's I name has been placed in nomination. Is there a second? I will lend a voice because I have a voice. Uh, I will second that nomination. Howard Friedman's name is on the uh, 
ballot for vice chair. Are there any other nominations for the position of vice chair? Yes, there are. I would like to offer the name of uh, Ms. Lynette Eastman. Uh, do I get to speak to that now or do I wait? No, you can get to speak to it right now. Okay, so I'd, I'd like to offer Ms. Eastman's name as the vice chair because I think she's eminently qualified uh, to become the vice chair of this board. She is in her uh, third term serving on the Board of Education. Uh, she is the chair of the Finance Committee of the Board of Education. Um, she has served as PTO chair, co-chair, and treasurer within the Bloomfield Public Schools. As a Bloomfield resident for 15 years, Ms. Eastman lives here with her family. She's a wife and a mother of two Bloomfield students. She has been a very involved parent, taking on the role of parent liaison for Laurel Elementary and Metacomet Elementary Schools in both the STEAM and Extended Day programs. Professionally, she is a managing paralegal at Voya Financial. She's clearly a parent who is committed to making sure our students get the resources they need to be a success in the school as well as in life. So therefore I nominate Ms. Lynette Eastman for the position of vice chair of the Bloomfield Board of Education. Is there a second? I second it. It's been properly moved and second. Are there any other nominations for the position of vice chair? Any other nominations for the position of vice chair? Hearing none, um, we will move to our voting. And I will ask again, Ms. Krista Cherry, if you would uh, do the roll call. I'll first do the roll call for the nomination of Howard Friedman. Femi Bogle, um, oh, sorry. Um, Hold on. I, I think it would be better if you just did the roll call and have the person name who they want to vote for. That's fine. Um, so we are to have two nominations on the floor. We have Howard Friedman and Lynette Eastman. I will first call on Femi Vogel Asagai for your Lynette nomination. Lynette Eastman has my vote. Lynette Eastman, your vote Lynette please. Eastman. Lynette Eastman. Howard Friedman, your vote? Howard Friedman. Mr. Donald Harris Jr., your vote? Howard Friedman. Mr. Robert Ike, your vote, please? Howard Friedman. Mr. Thomas Moore, your vote, please? Lynette Eastman. And Mr. Joseph Wilkerson Jr., your vote, please? Howard Friedman. Howard Friedman has the vote with four for Friedman and three for Ms. Eastman. Thank you. Congratulations, uh, Mr. Friedman. Thank you very and much. And I thank everyone um, on our board. And now we will move to uh, board secretary. The chair will entertain nominations for the position of board of education secretary. Mr. Chair? Yes. It is my honor to nominate as secretary of the Bloomfield Board of Education, Joseph C. Wilkerson, Jr. Second. Joseph Wilkerson has been moved and seconded for the position of uh, secretary of the Board of Education. Are there any other nominations for the position of secretary? Any other nominations for the position of secretary? Hearing none, seeing none, I'm going to move for nominations to be closed on said name and ask Ms. Uh, Krista Cherry to do the roll call. The nomination with a, of with Joseph, a yay or, With a yay or a nay. For Mr. Joseph Wilkerson Jr. for the position of secretary, Femi Vogel Asagai. What is your vote? My vote is a no. Lynette Eastman. No. Howard Friedman. Yes. Donald Harris Jr. Yes. Robert Ike. Yes. Thomas Moore. No. 
Joseph Wilkerson Jr. Yes. The yeses have it four to three. Thank you. Congratulations to Mr. Wilkerson, who is the uh, new board secretary. I thank all for your participation. And now we're going to move on to our, uh, our meeting. Item four of our meeting is the opening statement by the secretary, uh, Mr. Wilkerson. Would you please thank read? You. Yes. Um, good evening. As Secretary of the Board of Education, I wish to extend a warm welcome to everyone present and to our television viewers. The board, superintendent, the, the board, the superintendent, and I are pleased that you have joined us, and we celebrate this achievement, review information, and make policy decisions related to the effective operation of Bloomfield Public Schools. This is a regular meeting and all items will be discussed or voted on in this meeting have been posted as required by state law. As the Bloomfield Board of Education, we are here to set goals, listen to reports of the superintendent, approve budgets, contracts, and personnel appointments, and make policy for the district. We are not here to make management decisions or to solve problems of individuals. Management is the responsibility of the superintendent alone. Meetings of the board are open to the public. It is the time when the board conducts its business of governing the school system in a public area. The regular meetings are not meetings with the public. Therefore, comments from the audience will be confined to the time, design, and designated for the public to address the board. Decorum and courtesy are important elements in effective public meetings. Please silence your cell phones or communication devices and refrain from talking while others are speaking. Since it is legally mandated that the proceedings be accurately recorded, the board chair may have to ask for order periodically. Should noise begin to interfere with our recording capabilities, I'm pleased that you have taken the time this evening to join us. We're very proud of the school system and thank you for your interest in Bloomfield Public Schools. Thank you. Item five on their uh, consent agenda is the approval of the minutes from our October 12th meeting. Can I have a motion, please? Mr. Chair. So moved. I move that the group. Bob Pike move has moved. Is, the it, uh, is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been properly moved and second. Any edits, corrections? No edits or corrections. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Abstain. We have one abstention. The uh, minutes are hereby passed. Thank you. Um, at this time, we have our uh, student rep uh, presentation and the coming tonight from uh, Global Experience Magnet School. And I'm gonna apologize ahead of time if I uh, mispronounce the name, but um, Aminata Moham Mohammed Du and Aubrey, Aubrey Moran. Now, well, if I didn't mess them up too badly, hopefully they're out there. <laughs> and please proceed. Hello and good morning to the Board of Education and community members. Before we get started, we wanted to thank you all for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Global Experience Magnet School. We hope that you enjoy the presentation we've prepared for you tonight. Next slide, please. Good evening, my name is Amanada Mahalo. I'm from New Britain, Connecticut, and I'm a 12th grader at Global Experience Magnet School. This is my fifth year at GEMS. My experiences are amazing opportunities to travel. I've been to San Francisco, Hawaii, Washington, DC, and New York. Hello, my name is Aubrey Moran. I am from New Britain. I am currently a 10th grader here at Global Experience Magnet School. 
I have been attending GEMS for three years. My favorite teacher is Ms. Starr, and I like that there aren't many students here, and I have one, more one-on-one -on -one time with my teachers. Within GEMS, being a part of clubs and activities is a way to keep communication and interaction open between the students and staff. Furthermore, in our school, there are many students that are taking part in clubs. The students and staff continue to build great relationships outside of our academic classes. Highlighted are a few of our club offerings, like Student Council and the National Honor Society. Next slide, please. The Student Council will be holding elections next week for classroom representatives, as well as president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. Students will have the opportunity to run a short companion. The, the, the goal of the student council is to represent the interests of each class and to give a voice to the student body. Next slide, please. On October 6th, GEM students in grades six and seventh had a chance to take a field trip to Talco Tal Mountain Students enjoyed the outdoors and engaged in learning about the history of the mountain, Native Americans, and science related to geology and ecosystems. Next slide, please. GEMS juniors and seniors have already had the opportunity to participate in many virtual college visits. These visits allow GEMS students to become familiar with the culture ask questions and make a connection with admissions representatives that will be reviewing their applications if they choose to apply to those schools. Next slide, please. The National Honor, the National Honor Society has begun the year with a food drive to benefit our local community. GEMS is off to a great start collecting goods. Next slide, please. One of the ways that we have fun and show some school spirit is through dress down days. Last month, we celebrated with Halloween themed dress downs. To add to the fun, we made this a grade level comp competition based on participation. The seventh grade was the winner for the most spirited. Next slide, please. The GEM staff rallies to help the students be their best. They look for students that are doing the right thing and reward them with the raffle ticket. The goal of these tickets is to promote positive behavior. Next slide, please. On Thursday, October 28th, GEMS joined the district's virtual National Hispanic Heritage Month celebration. This special event highlighted the important contributions of the Hispanic community to American society, as well as what our students have been learning. Next slide, please. In review, the most important things you want to leave you with that we continue to be flexible and make changes to meet student needs, while also taking advantage of every enrichment opportunity, both in the school and the community. Thank you for your time tonight. And if you have any questions, we would be happy to answer them now. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Are there uh, any board questions? Any board questions? Lynette? No Good question, evening. just just um, a comment. Great presentation, ladies. Um, I'm really glad to see that um, the field trips are resuming. That's very important for our students to get out in the open air. Talcott Mountain's a great place. I hope you all enjoyed it, um, especially finding out the history of it. So um, I, I really hope you got to enjoy that. Glad to hear that there's college visits still happening, even though they're virtual. Uh, it is very important uh, and I'm I hope that you are all participating and finding a place that uh, you find comfortable in college. Thanks again, it was a great presentation. Thank you. Other comments? Chair? Yes. Um, um, once again, a great presentation. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, so all the Talcott Mountain. In my youth, I, I would be able to walk up there at this point in my life. I'm glad you're young, young enough to enjoy the view and being able to get up there. Ladies, um, where do you see yourself going to college? Have you made any plans with yet? Um, as a senior, I've decided to look into C Central Connecticut State University, but also other state colleges. 
Uh, uh, I hope you, hopefully you choose Central. That's exactly where I went, my major in sociology. As a freshman, I haven't really did much research, but I've looked into um, State University because I'm from Florida, so that's like kind of home, but yeah. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Okay, uh, thank you again, ladies. I appreciate it. Now you can head back and hit the books. <laughs> um, item seven is public PTO comment. Um, before I move to that, I, I do want to um, read some uh, uh, instructions that may help uh, you to uh, be able to deliver your comment or your question. <clears throat> your viewing listening device must have a microphone for two-way communication. During public PTO comment, if you wish to speak, press the raise hand symbol in the webinar control. Um, and that's under, uh, where is that? Re under reactions, you have uh, a raised hand uh, that you can just put up. Number three, uh, during public PTO comment, if you do not wish to speak, but wish to leave a comment, you may type your comments into the Q&A feature or the chat feature as follows, name, address, and your comment. Number four, if you do not have a microphone, you will need to call in on a phone in order to speak. Again, please give us your name, address prior to voicing your comments. And finally, per Board of Education policy, each speaker during public PTO comment is allotted two minutes. And again, my hope is that uh, we're going to be able to come together soon for a person to person meetings, but uh, we never know when it's, it's, it's going to be an end of this uh, COVID uh, pandemic, so. Okay, having said that, is there any uh, public or PTO comment? Any public or PTO comment? Any public or PTO comment? Okay, I'm moving on. Um, item eight, superintendent's report, Dr. Thompson. Good evening again. Uh, Thursday, November 11, schools are closed in observance of Veterans Day. Uh, on this day, we pay tribute to our military veterans who have served in the US Armed Forces. Awards. I'm honored to announce Bloomfield Public Schools is a 2021 recipient of the Bonnie B. Carney Award of Excellence for Educational Communications. This award is given to districts who demonstrate effective communications with their greater community. Here's some other updates. Health and safety. On Thursday, November 4th, the governor announced a revised quarantine protocol for schools called Screen and Stay Initiative. Essentially, the initiative supports students and staff staying in school and reducing quarantine under certain conditions. We have discussed the Screen and Stay Initiative with the West Hartford Bloomfield Health Department and received the final, finalized guidance from the state. The district is currently reviewing our protocols and will communicate any changes with all stakeholders. 
The U.S. Centers for Disease and Control and Prevention has approved a COVID-19 vaccination for children's ages five to 11. In partnership with Griffin Health in the West Hartford Bloomfield Health District, Bloomfield will be holding free student vaccination clinics for those ages five through 11 at Common A Race School. The dates have been provided in the superintendent's update. Wendy Shepard Danish, a COVID-19 liaison, will provide further details on data trends, the screen and stay initiative, and vaccinations. Talented and gifted program. I'm very excited to talk about this. While gathering information from our portrait of a graduate forums, it was clear that an accelerated learning program was needed for Bloomfield students. A talented and gifted program, TAG, will provide identification and services to students in grades three through eight in professional development for teachers. Tonight, you would hear an overview of this initiative from curriculum specialist, Emory Cullinan. Also joining us will be Dr. Sally, Sally Reese and also Dr. Nancy Eastlake from the University of Connecticut. They will share information about the school-wide enrichment model uh, that we will use to guide to develop our talented and gifted program. I will think this is an exciting addition to our school community. And to conclude my uh, evening report, I just wanna say I extend the warmest wishes for a restful and happy Thanksgiving recess. That concludes my report, Mr. Harris. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thompson. What I'm gonna do is uh, board, I'm gonna go through item A, B, and C, and then I'll, we'll open it up for questions. Uh, health and safety update, uh, Wendy, Shepard Banish, and uh, John Robinson. Good evening. Thank you, Chairman Harris. Good evening, rest of the Bloomfield Viewing Committee. Um, we have a short report tonight, but informative. Um, according to our positivity rate for Connecticut today, we are at 3.2%. Um, that is the highest that the state has seen over the last six weeks. We've been hovering right around that 2% range. So good data there. Bloomfield as of November 3rd was at 2.9%. In terms of our positivity rate among the schools and our um, positive announcement, student cases are the majority of our reports right now at 66%, and they are primarily um, within the elementary levels. 91% um, of our cases are reported as non-vaccinated, which makes sense since it's those elementary school students who have not been able to be vaccinated yet. Um, and in terms of our vaccination rates so far for our students, our 12 to 17 year olds are still at 53.75%. And um, our older, a few of our older students between 18 and 24 um, age range, those the vaccination rate there is 60.18%. So we are happy to announce that we do have scheduled clinics for our five to 11 year olds happening um, at Carmen A. Race Gym from two to five on the following dates, November 10th, December 1st, December 15th, and January 5th. They will happen two to five and parents will need to attend with their students and provide consent. Um, our weekly testing and screening initiative with our SEMA4 partners is certainly continuing. All staff and students have an opportunity to be able to be screened if they so choose. Um, there are consents that are filed beforehand. So far, we have approximately 60 students across the district and 95 staff members that regularly um, take advantage of those screening, um, those weekly screening opportunities. 
Um, as Dr. Thompson mentioned, in an effort to keep children safe in school and limit the number of quarantines that, have, that schools have been reporting across the state, the SDE and the Department of Public Health have been working for quite a few weeks now on designing a new optional protocol for districts to use for contact tracing. Uh, Governor Lamont did announce last week that this is called the Screen and Stay Initiative. Um, and all Connecticut schools can choose to participate in this initiative. For students and staff identified as close contacts to a known COVID-19 case, but are not fully vaccinated yet, they'll, remain, they'll be able to remain in school under certain conditions, so long as um, the school can assure that they were wearing their masks, and during that 14 day period after their exposure, they do not develop symptoms. The protocol will require parents to sign an affidavit and it provides precise directions on the daily screenings that parents will have to follow as they monitor their children still attending school and when to notify, when and how to notify the school if symptoms present. Um, so if they want to have their students stay in school and participate in the screen and stay, they will have to sign that affidavit prior. In consultation with the West Hartford Bloomfield Health District, our current community transmission rate does support the implementation of this protocol at this time, but um, we are going to continue to monitor the rates through the holiday season and um, make sure that we stay within those positive, um, those healthy positivity rates. Um, we are currently working with our medical team to establish the logistics and the operationalization of the new protocol, and more information will be coming forward in the next few weeks. Um, that concludes my report for this evening, unless there are any questions. Uh, John, were you adding anything? Yes, sir. Um, I, I would just want to briefly update the board um, on the uh, our vaccination and uh, compliance with the governor's executive order. So currently the district is at um, 95, I'm sorry, 99.5% compliant with the executive order. 94% uh, of our staff are vaccinated. 5.5% uh, rounding um, are currently testing. Uh, and as Wendy pointed out, our testing uh, for most of our staff is occurring uh, in our schools, uh, so it's, it's non-disruptive. Uh, they can test uh, on location. They get very quick results. Um, I was a little surprised to hear that 95 staff uh, are testing because um, 28 are required to test. We have a lot of staff who are uh, testing proactively. Uh, we also have two staff who are non-compliant and are currently on leave. Uh, the percentage of vaccination is uh, 94% is relatively high. Uh, it's going up a little bit. We're finding that some of our staff who are um, either have a medical or religious exemption um, have, have chosen to vaccinate. Uh, so that number is going down a little bit, vaccination numbers going up. Uh, and any new staff we hire have to be vaccinated. Um, so uh, I think we're in pretty good shape with that. Thank you. Thank you. I just kind of realized the folly of my uh, statement about waiting for all three reports. So I'm going to take that back. And are there any questions on item B, the health and safety update from the board? Lynette? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this question could be for Dr. Thompson or um, Ms. Shepard Banish. Um, just wondering with the um, vaccination clinics for our younger students are, how are we preparing um, for a possible influx of, you know, children being home, um, not feeling well? Um, the other part of this question is, are we just going to, um, you know, keep them home anyway, or um, wait for symptoms? Uh, are we going to take it into consideration that they just got vaccinated if um, they do come down with symptoms? Um, how are we preparing for that and, and handling that? Certainly, if a parent reports that their child just got vaccinated and they are not feeling good, we will certainly take that into consent with into um, consideration with their attendance and make sure that, you know, there is um, ample time to make up any work that's lost and prepare the teachers for that. But certainly it is a possibility. Thank you. Other questions? Uh... I have a question from Mr. Go Robinson. Ahead. Go ahead. 
Um, basically, you stated, I think you stated that two staff are in non-compliance, so they're not they're not in the schools. They're in non-compliance. The yeah. question that, yeah. excuse Sorry, me, yeah. I um, the question that I that I basically have because they non once they become compliant, they go back to school. Is that it or? Yes. Yeah, that, that is correct. So we've been in communication uh, with both staff members sort of throughout the, um, the whole process. Uh, if they choose to comply, uh, they can come right back to work. And how about financial wise, would, would that be a union matter? Uh, like, uh, you know, because, because of the COVID thing, are they getting, are they using their time? Are we paying them? Or is this something that the union gets involved with or? Uh, I'm just trying to figure out how, how this works out. Sure. The, the two staff members are currently on unpaid leave. Uh, one of the staff members is salaried um, and is on unpaid leave. The other staff member uh, is an hourly worker and, and is just not being assigned any hours. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Um, Wendy, uh, is, is there... How are our parents dealing with the mask? I, I don't hear a lot coming out of Bloomfield as opposed to other districts where there is a large pushback on the mask and signs on lawns and other towns unmask our kids. Um, I don't have a sense that that's going on in Bloomfield. Am I correct? I, I, I have not had any reports or any complaints on any difficulties with mask wearing or non-compliance with masks or any of the above. Um, the majority of our concerns are around, you know, when children have to quarantine. And I think, you know, the new vaccination with our elementary school students and the new screen and stay protocol is going to even help those concerns significantly. Thank you. Other uh, questions, Mr. Friedman. Um, Wendy, one quick question regarding you know our young people, specifically those that are five years old, um, getting their first, in this case, you know, um, COVID vaccine. How are we preparing them um, in class? Are you know are our teachers discussing what's going to take place? You know, the procedure, uh, what they're going to feel what you know um, the needle what, the importance of getting this are we doing any instructions to our young people to especially for our young folks to uh, offset any fears that they may have certainly since it is a family choice at this time we have not been doing any instruction in class but certainly our nurses are available to support any parents that you know need any kind of literature or instruction or any of that to be able to support their students that might be going into, into vaccination. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Guzman, financial report. Bill, you're muted. I'm texting him now. Looks like he disconnected, he's coming back in. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Looked like he went back out, uh, John. Um, it says he's connected. Um, I can't find. There you are. Okay. Okay, okay Mon. You're on. Right, yeah, you're on. Mom, I am so sorry um, for that delay. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Harris, and um, good evening, members of the board and viewing public. Um, this report uh, is as of November 4th, 2021, and represents the first four months of the fiscal year. At this time, approximately $11.3 million, or 23.4% of the budget, has yet to be expended or encumbered. On the summary page, <clears throat> you will note that major accounts 03 employee benefits shows <clears throat> a balance of 76% of the account still remaining because funds have yet to be encumbered for health insurance or for pension. Other post-employment benefits contribution to the town has been paid over the, since the last report in the amount of $615,134. Also on the summary page, major account 08 tuition shows 35% of the budget still remaining because funds have not yet been encumbered for magnet school tuition. Going to the detailed report on page one of, of the sixth, you will see on page one at the very top, account 1110, salaries for teachers, is overexpended at this time by $12,000. Last month, the overexpended amount was just over $110,000. Since last month, special education out of district tuition revenue has been posted, as we mentioned in our previous report. Also on page one of the detailed report, account 1230, salaries for Paris, is overexpended by $42,000 because we have hired two special education instructional assistants for children requiring one-to-one -one assistance as per their individualized educational program. Going to... Um, Finally, on page four of the detailed report, you will see account number 5630, tuition for private, remains overexpended by $190,000 because the excess cost grant receivable has yet to be posted. These revenues will be booked next month once the district files a special education data report with the State Department of Education. Mr. Harris, that concludes my report for November. Thank you. Any questions on the report? Any board questions? Ms. Eastman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so that line item um, for the extra paras, um, the two additional. Right. Uh, is um, are those students um, new students who are uh, who have ident been identified as needing extra help, or um, are they are we just kind of sh shifting? Are we having additional uh, resources for the same amount of students? I'm just trying to figure out if if you know we have more that are being identified. I think uh, I, I, I Wendy had to leave the meeting. No, but, I'm uh, here, Bill. Are, are I'm you, here, Bill. Uh, Wendy, can you yep. answer that question? Sure. Hi, Ms. Eastman. We've actually had several students um, move into the district this year with IEPs that did have significant needs. So those two additions are for new students that moved in with those um, supports already written into their plans. Okay. So it's not just two students for these, these two pair, uh, prof paraprofessionals. It's, uh, you know, however many new ones that we just got in, new students that we just... We, we, we share supports wherever we can, yes. Okay, thank you. Ms. Bogle, that's the guy. You're muted. 
I'm sorry, just to follow up on the special education question. Um, Ms. Banish, you just said several students moved into the district with IEPs already in place. Uh, do we have the numbers of students who uh, were servicing with uh, IEPs? Is it possible to get those numbers? Superintendent? It is, po it is, yeah. it is, possible. It is possible to get those numbers. Um, I can tell you off the top of my head, because we right, are, right now are in the process of doing our state data reporting. Um, mm -hmm. Within the district, 20% of our students are students that are identified needs. So that's around 400, little over 400 students within our school buildings. But then the total number of special education students that we are responsible for, both within Bloomfield schools and within the magnet schools, because we're responsible for paying their tuition or students that are in out of district placements, we are about over, we are um, just over 500 this year. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And to Mr. Guzman, um, what happens to unencumbered funds within a, any given fiscal year? Well, <clears throat> at the end of the year, um, typically um, the account managers or the uh, directors of the various accounts will encumber those monies because they projected in their budgets that these expenditures are necessary for um, a variety of items within their school or within their department. So they'll encumber those funds uh, prior to expenditure. What happens come spring, if there are any funds that are unencumbered at that time, or somebody encumbered, let's say $10,000 for a particular project, and the actual expenditure was 8,000, so there's two thousand dollars there that remains. So as we begin, as we begin to close out the fiscal year, we will ask for um, for those unencumbered monies to be um, either expended in their individual cost center or returned to the to the district as a whole, because there's a an array of um, of expenditure requirements request that may come in from one particular area in which they do not have the funds to cover that we will make a transfer. But at the end of the year, we will make a, a concerted effort to, um, if we have a balance at the end of the year, we will, uh, and we've done this in the past, we will put that money in a 1% uh, set aside account that we have um, that was established by the Board of Education with the Town Council many years ago. So any money that's not expended at the end of the year, we will put into that 1% set aside account for uh, <clears throat> future use for non recurring capital expenditures that may come up. But um, uh, Okay, thank you very much. It's You're interesting welcome. to hear about the 1% set aside account. I now have an interest in that account. How much do we have there and how much money do we generally put into that account? Well, it depends on uh, the, uh, the status of the fiscal year. I can tell you that um, uh, last year we put in uh, over $200,000 into that account. Uh, <clears throat> and again, that, that money um, will be used in future years for an unanticipated capital project that we may come across. I can tell you that uh, five years ago, uh, <clears throat> through the efforts of Dr. Thompson, that account had, uh, had sufficient amount of money in there to pay for the artificial turf at the high school. So we didn't have to go back to the town council to ask for additional appropriation. We had a sufficient money in that 1% set aside uh, to cover that uh, that cost. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. You're welcome. And uh, to add add a little bit more to that, um, that fund was uh, that type of fund was set up originally by the legislature, so it, it is not just between the, the council and the board. Yeah, it okay. was uh, it was set up by the legislature. In fact, I think they have increased the uh, the dollar amount to one and a half or 2%, uh, but we would have to go back to the council and reach an agreement to do that um, because we can't hold it. Right now we can't hold anything more than the 1%. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Wilkinson. Yes. 
and you might want to turn your video off. Okay, how about now? So this, next, this question is for Mr. Guzman. Um, I recall you mentioning in line item 8 that there were, I guess, unrecovered funds uh, from that was really the time frame in terms of recovering those funds. And how does this affect our bottom line? I, I, Mr. Harris, I, I just had a hard time. I, I, I couldn't I get that question. Yeah. Um, Mr. Wilk, Mr. Wilkerson, can you put your question into the, the chat. chat, type it into the chat? Yes, can you do? Yes. Well, I'm waiting for him to put that question in. Uh, any other questions on uh, Mr. Guzman's uh, the finance report? Okay, I don't see anything yet. Uh, and while we're waiting, quick, uh, if I may, a quick question um, to Mr. Guzman. Go ahead, Howard. Um, this is not regarding your, your your report tonight, but when do we start getting uh, to look at um, some of the other, or you know, our insurance, the the buses? When do we start looking at negotiations for hopefully lowering some of our prices um, with some of the things that we're able to negotiate? Um, I know we have um, amount of years that we have per item. When can we start negotiating again for our various budgets with these other line items? Well, on insurance in particular, medical health insurance for employees, uh, we're constantly looking at that. Our uh, consultants that we, along with the town, have is Brown and Brown. Uh, <clears throat> they will uh, look at the Signer. You know, as you know, we are self-funded, so we'll look at the um, the claims that have been submitted, the amount of claims, whether or over what was projected, under what was projected. Yeah. And um, they will provide us with a, um, a number going forward in terms of next year's budget as to uh, what, they, what they feel is a good solid projection for medical insurance cost. Um, in our discussions with them, um, <clears throat> there's always the possibility of going out to bid either for medical insurance, uh, administrative cost, um, stop loss insurance. So those things are always on the table and uh, our uh, consultants guide us as we go through that process. And transportation? Transportation, as you know, well, uh, as you know, we have a multi-year contract with both, uh, with both companies, DATGO and Access. So um, at this particular point, I think we have uh, two more years for the DATGO contract. I think two more years for both contracts. So probably sometime next year, we'll uh, put out a bid for continued services for transportation for both um, uh, regular transportation and for special education. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Guzman, look in the chat box. Yep. Uh, Mr. Wilkinson's question is there. Well, uh, the question is um, on line item eight, 
um, which is tuition, you stated there were unrecovered funds from, um, I'm not too sure I used the word unrecovered funds from crack and magnet schools. Um, how does that affect overall our budget and what is the expected time frame, time frame for recovering those funds? Um, <clears throat> with respect to children going to crack schools, magnet schools, we pay a tuition as Mrs. Uh, Shepherd Banish mentioned before, but we also receive tuition for the numbers of students that are attending our magnet schools. So uh, <clears throat> those are uh, uh, funds that we anticipate. And um, <clears throat> once those revenues come in, we apply them to our budget. And when we apply them to the budget, um, in, uh, in, in some particular cases, we'll use utilize those numbers to uh, balance out our salary accounts that I mentioned previously, both the teacher salary account and the, um, and the uh, non-certified salary accounts. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, any other uh, final questions? Okay. Uh, thank you. Item nine under new business, uh, talented and gifted program, Anne-Marie Cullinan. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Thompson, Chairman Harris, viewing and listening audience and our Board of Education members. Um, if I could have slide one up, John. As part of our ongoing portrait of a graduate monthly update, slide one puts in the forefront once again our focus on our competencies. As you know, they're critical thinkers. We want our students to be problem solvers, communicators, and adaptable in different environments and situations. Um, as we move to slide two, we see that the breakout of our various committees that will help us equip our students with these 21st century competencies. Tonight, we will highlight our new program for gifted and talented. We are happy to report that we have made much progress since last month. We have selected our teachers who went through various screenings and interviews and are here with us tonight. And we also have Dr. Sally Reese and Dr. Nancy Eastlake from our partners at UConn um, and with the Ranzuli Center who will be working very closely with us. Let me first introduce our teachers, Mrs. Jeannie Pascone, and Ms. Juanita Richardson. Ladies, do you have anything you'd like to say? Um, just thank you so much for this opportunity. Truly looking forward to helping Bloomfield develop this program from the ground up. I think it's a, an amazing opportunity um, for our kids and it's really much needed, especially now we have such gaps in learning across our kids and our kids at, at the higher end really, really need some challenge and some enrichment. And through what we will do with the Renzuli Center, the school-wide enrichment model, there's really so much that we can offer to all the students as well. So I'm hoping to, uh, to really dig, dig deep and get this going soon. Thank you, Jeannie. Juanita? Um, I'm just gonna have to say ditto. I think you kind of covered it, <laughs> Jeannie. I'm very excited for this opportunity. Looking forward to moving kids you know, to their highest potential and really excited to learn about the Renzuli program and put that into practice in Bloomfield. Thank you, ladies. We're very, very happy that um, you'll be joining us in, this posi in these positions. And now I'd like to turn it over to our esteemed guests, Dr. Sally Reese and Dr. Nancy Eastlake. Good evening. I'm uh, Sally Reese. I'm a professor at the University of Connecticut, and I've been working there for well, a long time, since the mid-1980s. And uh, Nancy and I have worked together also for a long time. Nancy will introduce herself, but she has been the Director of Enrichment Programs in both West Hartford and Manchester. I also have a background in gifted education and talent development, and, and am one of the two co-authors of the school-wide enrichment model. I'm gonna share my screen briefly, um, just so I can show you a bit of a PowerPoint. Uh, and what I'll be doing tonight is just talking briefly a, a little bit about the school-wide enrichment model and primarily why, why this approach and why I think Bloomfield selected it. And we're very, we're very pleased that we that, that you did. Um, the school-wide enrichment model is one of the 
best known uh, enrichment and talent development gifted education programs in the world. It's used um, in thousands of school districts in the United States and in any and in these countries. Um, there are school wide enrichment programs that are magnet schools, charter schools, gifted programs, enrichment programs, theme schools. And I've been at this with my partner, Joe Renzulli at UConn for over four decades. Um, I, I sent uh, an article on the research base of the model, but uh, it is a research based model. Um, every component of this particular approach to gifted education and talent development has been researched. Um, we've implemented this widely in places like New York City. Some of you may have read the recent controversy in New York City and seen and seen articles indicating that they want to go back to the school-wide enrichment model as opposed to testing students at four years old for separate classes. So, um, you know, oftentimes when there is a belief that we need to be more inclusive in our identification um, and include more young people and more students, we, we get called. And we're very pleased about that because it is, uh, as I mentioned, not only a gifted education, but also a talent development approach. It's based on uh, Joe Renzulli's three ring conception of giftedness. So when we ask who are these students will be serving, they're students with above average ability in whom we want to develop task commitment and creativity. So it's a talent development approach. Briefly, there are three services. Um, and by the way, we want to develop this in certain students at certain times and under certain circumstances. And the circumstances are the enrichment opportunities that we provide in school. Um, and, and we also feel it's really, really important that we understand that the need to develop task commitment occurs most often in bright kids that are not as challenged as they should be. Jeannie mentioned, this is a, a tremendous challenge in Connecticut where we oftentimes will see 10 grade levels of reading instruction in one chronological grade. And when you have students that are reading several grade levels below, that's the nat natural inclination of the teacher to bring those students up to grade level where you also have students at or above grade level in the same class that may not get um, very much attention. So our goal is to try to make sure that every child makes continuous progress, which fits in beautifully with what Anne-Marie mentioned as district priorities. So I, I think it's, it's a very good match. The model itself has three basic services. We take a look at students' strengths. So we're, we're looking at their interests, the ways they like to learn, um, the ways they like to do work. We modified curriculum for students who already know something, uh, a, a procedure called curriculum compacting. This is incredibly popular with parents because if you have a student that already knows the content, what we try to do is document that and then give them different kinds of work, including some work based on their interests. And then third, a series of enrichment opportunities um, based on the enrichment triad model, which is the, um, the curricular approach. And this was also developed at the University of Connecticut. There's uh, the three services and we try to apply, apply those to the regular curriculum, to um, a, a series of opportunities for all students. And this is the school-wide enrichment part of this. They're called enrichment clusters. And then third, a continuum of services. So taking kids to Talcott Mountain Science Center, field trips, opportunities for in-depth learning that might extend after school, um, opportunities for students to work at home on some of their projects. The goal of this model is to make sure we're providing enrichment that produces enjoyment, engagement, and more enthusiasm for learning. Those are the three goals of this particular approach. And I will say this is, again, used in many school districts, um, many places in Connecticut, across the country, and as you saw, across the globe. Just give you one, a couple of examples. I could give you hundreds, but one of the goals of this is, is creative productive opportunities. So I would love to see by the end of this year, students from Bloomfield placing in, uh, in the top five or 10 kids to win at invention convention. We'd love to see students from Bloomfield winning Connecticut History Day. We'd love to see students from Bloomfield 
participating in Connecticut State Science Fair. It's a model that focuses on creative productivity. So here's one example of this, a young girl who is in a, a gifted program based on the enrichment um, school-wide enrichment model who became interested in ladybugs because of a unit taught in one of her classrooms. Um, and she was only in second grade when she developed this interest. Her fascination with ladybugs lasted three years. The end of that time, she produced the ladybug game, which she did happen to sell. Um, and she, by the way, by the time she was done selling this to Target, she had saved a couple of years worth of college tuition from the production of her game. Um, many, many students become involved in these kinds of projects. Um, I, I don't know Juanita, but when Jeannie was the enrichment specialist in West Hartford, uh, the gifted education specialist working with Nancy, um, there were type three fairs in West Hartford that just were amazing. Students that did science projects, students that did inventions, kids that were involved in historical research, students that did projects because they are trying to do things for other people. This is a young boy who, uh, his name was Sydney, is Sydney Keys, and he started um, a book club for younger students, online book club for young African American boys because he said there were not a lot of books that he wanted to read that were available in school classrooms. So he started his own book club. He read books to kids, he got books donated. He called it books, uh, books and bros. And, and so these are some of the, the opportunities. Let me just speak briefly about curriculum compacting. Um, I've conducted some of the research on curriculum compacting. This is a procedure whereby we identify what a student knows already. Um, by doing pre-assessment, by training teachers to pre-assess. We eliminate the content that they have already proven that they know, and we replace it with more challenging or more uh, creative work for them. So this is a very, very popular part of school-wide enrichment with parents. Um, I won't go into all the aspects, but I do wanna mention, as I did earlier, the heart of this is exposure, enrichment, training, problem solving, critical thinking. We call this type two enrichment and we'll be doing uh, many things with students that will expose them to new ideas, new topics, new areas of interest. And we have a taxonomy. This becomes in a lot of ways, the curriculum of the enrichment program. And there'll be a series of skills developed on this. Um, I will be helping from the University of Connecticut. I'm not, no charge donating my services. Delighted to see this happen um, in Bloomfield and so proud and happy to be a part of it. Um, I will also mention briefly that um, the part of the SEM that is appropriate for all kids is that we would hope by second, end of second semester to have a series of enrichment clusters run so that once a week, all students in the school get to participate in a planned enrichment experience. This might be creative writing, it might be creating a play, it might be invention convention, it might be historical research, but every single child in the school gets to do this. So all children have a chance for continuous identification. We oftentimes don't know that a student has a talent unless they're doing something in an area in which they have an interest. So we'll be doing some enrichment for all kids. I'm just going to wrap this up. Here's a you know, a couple of enrichment cluster um, examples that students sign up for these in advance. And again, they do them in areas of interest. I won't, I'll, I'll send this PowerPoint because I don't want to take a lot more time, but there's a series of uh, major fe features of these enrichment clusters. And also there's the opportunity within enrichment clusters to do things in all different areas. And we try to do this during regular school day so that all students have an opportunity. And just to wrap up, the idea behind the um, behind this is that we can do exposure in all all types of areas for all kids in a school. So just briefly, the last thing I'll say is that um, we have lots of years in understanding what makes for an outstanding SEM program, and then I'd be happy to take questions. Uh, also, um, introduce Nancy. But we know we know what it takes to do this. We know the kind of professional development it takes. We know the kinds of opportunities it takes for students to develop their talents. And most importantly, um, we know that we wanna celebrate excellence and we want to introduce higher levels of challenge for students 
that are able to do the work and those that actually uh, might develop an interest so that they want to do more work in school based on something in which they have an interest. So that's a little bit about the SEM, a little bit about the work that we've done at UConn and a little bit about what we, what we will be doing um, with Bloomfield over, over the next year. Congratulations on, um, on this initiative and uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to work with you. Let me stop Thank you, Dr. Reese. Nancy? Hey, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Sally. That was uh, extremely comprehensive and, uh, um, and, and we'll be talking more about that, I assure all of you in the, in the coming weeks. Um, one of my jobs will, to be, will be to make sure that there's really a very thorough understanding of what school-wide enrichment is, what it really means, and what it can bring to every student in your district. Um, very soon, I will be meeting with Anne-Marie Cullinan, and we will discuss moving forward and developing a uh, planning committee which will be composed of administration and teachers um, and other member, other people as well. And Anne Marie need to, and I need to discuss that uh, to know exactly who. But um, that will be happening quickly, and um, and then we will gradually decide uh, once we have an understanding of the model. We'll be, we'll be deciding exactly how this will bring, uh, will bring this forward into the Bloomfield schools to be representative of all that Bloomfield is as a school district. And uh, one of the beauties of this model is it is very adaptable. It can, and th there's so many different facets to it that uh, the interpretation of it works very well in all kinds of districts, whether they are urban, whether they are suburban, whether they are very rural, it's it's about uh, exciting education. And um, I am, you know, at this point, just to say, delighted to be the person to bring it to all you. Sally will be there behind me, I know, um, all the way. But um, I will be working very deliberately and. Um, and, and happily with all of you. So thank you uh, for this opportunity and, um, and congratulations to Jean Pascone. And um, uh, I'm sorry, the other- Juanita, person, Juanita Richardson. Juanita, thank you. Uh, to you as becoming the, the, the uh, you know, charter members of the teaching corps. And uh, we, have a, we have a lot of work to do, but it's great work. And uh, we, we're gonna be a great team. So thank you, Anne-Marie, for all that you've done so far to make this happen. Well, thank you both, Dr. Reese and Dr. Eastlake. We are very, very excited to get this project off the ground. And I think we have a, a great team already started. So thank you. And I could, we can take any questions if there are any. Mr. Yeah, Harris. Beginning with uh, Ms. Bogolasagai and then uh, Mrs. Eastman. This is not a question, it's rather a statement. I, I want to say that I am very excited about this program. Uh, when we heard about it at our last meeting or the meeting before um, from the uh, charter members as it were, uh, it sounded exciting then, it's sounding even more exciting to me now, particularly hearing that it is in fact adaptable, because obviously in the Bloomfield school system, you're going to have to be adaptable with it. I'm excited to hear about you uh, saying it is a school-wide enrichment program, as opposed to merely uh, siphoning some students off who clearly have the ability and the interest and the motivation to do exciting education work. So I'm excited to have this in our school, schools in Bloomfield. Um, it seems that we're at the ground floor, so we may take, and tell me if I'm wrong, five years or so before we begin to see some results, um, because I'm, I'm interested in results waiting for results. In fact, I'm going to read your paper thoroughly, 
We've received it, so I'm going to read that so I have a full understanding of the model that we're talking about. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And we, we uh, I just want to say we hope we'll see some um, some results as early as, as next spring. I mean, it, it probably takes, if you want to look at uh, a full implementation, it may take three years. But you'll see students doing projects, you'll see students having enrichment opportunities, you'll see students and teachers becoming involved in various levels of enrichment as early as next spring. So we won't we won't take a uh, you know a full year even to get started with various components of the model. But it may be that um, not maybe, but it will be interesting also to see the response of our teachers because you know teachers like so many others are, are a creature of habit. So the in-service training that is going to be necessary, um, and I'm sure there's going to be some, I'd like to hear what that is going to look like, uh, Dr. Thompson. Um, Thank if you'll have Thank a, you. a rolling program or something to that. Sure, effect. we will keep you updated on okay. the uh, progress as we begin to implement it and also after implementation. Okay, good enough. Thank you. Ms. Eastman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I echo uh, my colleagues' comments about this being very exciting. Um, I, I can't wait to hear more about it. If you could clarify something for me before I ask my questions. Um, so th the program, um, everyone has access to it or is it, are we identifying some students first and then um, kind of rolling it out to others? H how does that work? Yeah, there's, there's generally a talent pool of students identified, and that might be 5, 10, 15% of the population for various services, such as curriculum compacting, such as advanced opportunities for enrichment. Um, those are students who just by any definition are, are kids that might need more challenge right away. But then there are additional levels of enrichment that are also applied to all students. So we might have school-wide enrichment opportunities for for lectures or for field trips or for, or for various kinds of talent development opportunities that are also given to all students. So it isn't a, a either them or us approach. It's some students get some advanced services early on because they need them, but all students get various forms of enrichment um, starting really almost as soon as the program begins. Okay, and thank you. And so Anne-Marie, how many students have we identified um, for that, this kind of the, the initial okay. program. <clears throat> Ms. Eastman, that is part of um, the committee work. Um, by the state of Connecticut, we are legislated to identify students that fall into the category, and it does come under um, Wendy Shepard Banish's department. We are not required in the state of Connecticut to offer services. We are doing um, both. We are identifying and we will be offering um, programs. Many districts do offer programs. Um, I don't have a number. I can get that number to you, but that's part of the work of this committee as we um, set some goals around the identification process that we will use. It will be up to us. Um, you know, they, um, they look at various things. They look at assessments. They look at student portfolios. They look at uh, recommendations, teacher recommendations, parent recommendations, students recommending themselves. So there's various ways to go that, but as we go through this process, as Dr. Thompson said, his ex expectation is that we continually inform the board of our progress. Thank you. Mr. Ike. Uh, yes, excuse my, my ignorance. Now, is this a gifted and talented? I thought there's something in the agenda. Is this under the gifted and talented or bringing the gifted and talented program to the, yes. to the district? Yes. Uh, so it is under the gifted and talented. Yeah. And yes, so right. Years, yes. Years, years and years ago, we did have a gifted and talented program. And then because of funding restraints, I guess we got rid of it. So we have not had gifted and talented program for quite a few years. Probably over 10 that? years, I believe. I thought so. So. I'm a little, I have a, I have a little readiness in the sense that normally gifted and talented programs are, are selected for a certain level of students, but it appears that this gifted and talented program is going to be for the entire district. Yes. So, so. Yes, so it'll have a different focus. Okay, 
So is it really gifted and talented, or is it just, is just just another enrichment program? It it's both. I mean, so oh. so one of the reasons that people generally uh, look at our model is that we have a continuum of services. <clears throat> Some services for your your top three to five to ten percent and other services for, for all students in the district. So we believe that we can accomplish um, both talent development and gifted education under this umbrella. Uh, and, and so we'll, we will be attempting to do both and I think we'll be successful at it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, questions or comments? Uh, Mr. Chair, yes. one quick question. Will we be forming any partnerships with any other entities like um, the University of Hartford or the Hart School of Music or any other any other outside concern? Mr. Friedman, we're, we um, have partnerships with um, several outside community agencies and universities through all of those subcommittees on that um, slide that I showed you. Each of those committee has has a partner. Um, University of Hartford, for instance, was our partner this summer when we um, sent many of our students there tuition free. Um, and the Hart School, one of our music teachers, works very closely with them. So some of our students have an opportunity to have that experience. But we are always seeking out um, community, business, and university partnerships. Thank you. As well as, yeah. Ms. Reese is at, you're at UConn, right? Yes. So, yes. Yeah, so there's, there's another partner. Okay. <laughs> Any other uh, questions, comments? Okay. Thank you, Anne Marie. Thank you. Okay. Um, item 9B, the policy for initial reading, age of attendance and students who are homeless. Mr. Guzman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Harris. Uh, <clears throat> these two policies were presented to the policy committee for an initial reading on <clears throat> October 26th. And um, we're bringing it to the uh, board for its first reading as well. Uh, the two policies are 5112, which is age of attendance, which is a mandated policy. And the second policy is policy um, 5118.1, which is students who are homeless. Uh, both these policies are mandated policies and they were driven by um, legislation passed in Public Act 19-179. Um, and in essence, the language that's being added to the policies is to allow parents the ability to uh, question, protest, if you will, uh, a decision by the administration to one, uh, deny a child uh, access to school because of age or deny access to a student because he or she is homeless. And both policies in the new language basically say that the parent has uh, 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 has to be given a written reason for exclusion or denial of access to school and the ability to have a hearing before the full board of education or a subcommittee of the board of education to, uh, to hear their concerns. So at this particular point, the administration is recommending that uh, these two uh, policies at the uh, uh, the next board meeting uh, be adopted for uh, for inclusion in the board policy handbook. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and again, most of the board had the opportunity to uh, to vet these two uh, policies that were being presented tonight. Um, and this is just the first reading. They will come back before us again uh, at a policy meeting later this month and then uh, moving on at our December meeting uh, for a vote uh, to become a part of our policy book. But uh, while we have them on the agenda, any questions on either policy? 
Okay. Um, Mr. Guzman, you're up again. Board uh, 9C, the Board of Education meeting schedule. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Uh, <clears throat> the schedule you see in front of you is uh, required by board policy and actually by state law. Uh, <clears throat> the Board of Education, uh, this is board policy 9321, which basically says the Board of Education shall set a calendar of regular meetings for the ensuing year at the first regular meeting in November. And, <clears throat> and uh, those sets of dates uh, for uh, of the calendar for those meetings uh, presented to the town clerk no later than November 30th of the year. So <clears throat> uh, you'll see here that, uh, and as you all know, that the regular board meetings of the, uh, of the Board of Education are held the first Tuesday of every month. But on this particular calendar, <clears throat> you'll see that there are four exceptions to that, and they're referenced at the bottom of the page. April 5th is not the first, second uh, Tuesday, but rather the first. And it's scheduled because <clears throat> for the fifth, because of the spring recess that occurs between April 11 and 15. <clears throat> the June 7th meeting should be, uh, is the first uh, <clears throat> Tuesday of the month. And that's because there's a conflict that June, uh, the second Tuesday being June 14th is the last day, the proposed last day of school for the school year. And then finally, <clears throat> there are two dates in September and October um, that have conflicts with uh, September 19th is an observance of the Jewish holiday Rosh Hashanah and October 13th is an observance of the Jewish holiday Sukkot. So those four exceptions are noted at the bottom of the page. And uh, I should also note that February 24th of 2022 is a special board meeting. And that's typically to, uh, to adopt the board, uh, the board budget in a special session, special, special session. So the administration recommends adoption of these um, calendar dates for meetings for next year. Thank you. Mr. Friedman. I move that the Bloomfield Board of Education approve the 2022 Board of Education meeting schedule as presented. Second. Been properly moved and second. Questions? Questions? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I do have, I have a question, Mr. Chairman. Now, Go ahead. Well, it's the schedule, will we be able to continue to have these Zoom meetings, our uh, hybrid, if we're moving forward? How are we going to roll that out? Because quite honestly, I'm able to sit here on a cruise ship and participate in the meeting, which I think is outstanding with the technology. How, how are we going to roll this out so that other board members, if they're on official leave, they're able to participate in the meeting or other people in the community are able to participate in the meeting well, if even if they're not in, in in town or in state or wherever they are, that's that's my question, Mr. Chairman. That's it's a good question. It should not be a part of this uh, this vote, uh, but um, just I think it's something we need to uh, plan to talk about at our next meeting. Uh, you know, I had hoped we were going to come together. Uh, for a um, person to person um, at the latest next month, but um, I'm still not sure. And and what do we do about the persons who uh, want to stay online um, attending meetings? And to further complicate that, um, the Board of Ed needs to establish a policy so that board members can be away, but can also be a part of uh, the meeting because um, we don't have that uh, procedure in place right now. So um, Dr. Thompson, can you uh, think about a presentation um, for next month? Sure. Uh, but meanwhile, on our, um, we have a motion on the floor to approve this Board of Education meeting schedule for 2022. Are there any further questions on that schedule? 
Hearing none, seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. One opposition. Uh, abstentions? I don't think she who's was opposing. Opposition? She mm -hmm. said aye. No, who's the opposition? I approve. Oh, I agreed. I, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was on mute. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. So we are unanimous in our agreement. Thank you. Um, cave updates. Um, mm. It's... Uh, I have served CAVE as their president, their state president for the past two years. I come out of office on uh, Friday into the uh, very enjoyable office of uh, immediate past, past president. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, the delegate assembly is this Thursday and CAVE convention is on Friday. Other than that, not much is happening with CAVE right now. Um, so that's that's it for uh, for the CAVE. Um, board comments, Mr. Ike? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I wanna congratulate uh, new board member, Ms. Wilson, and all the returning board members. Secondly, I want to congratulate you and Dr. Thompson on those awards. Uh, I saw in the messenger uh, by the NAACP, the 100 most influential African Americans in the state of Connecticut. And then lastly, uh, I wanted to commend all board members who stepped forward for leadership positions. It's been a long time since I've been on that we've had multiple people seeking leadership position. So I want to thank everybody for stepping forward. Uh, again, I, I, I just can't emphasize how Zoom allows not only board members, but allows all the citizens to participate in, in, in government, no matter where you are in the world. So I want to thank the board members for allowing me to be on this cruise ship. I'm sitting here at the dinner table, and I'm listening to the meeting. I'm, I'm taking in everything, and you just don't know what the feeling is like. So thank you very much. Have a good meeting. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Reich. Ms. Eastman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanna first say, uh, I don't know if she's still on, but Mrs. Pascone, uh, good to see you again. She actually helped my daughter through a very rough uh, COVID year. <laughs> she was fantastic, very patient, um, wonderful teacher. So it was very good to see you again. Thank you for um, all that you do. Thank you, Lynette, that means a lot to me. Problem. Um, okay, next, just want to welcome our new board member, Joseph Wilkerson. Um, looking forward to working with you uh, in the future. Um, I want to congratulate all my colleagues who were voted into leadership positions tonight. I'm looking forward to seeing this team lead with uh, honesty and transparency. Um, while I am disappointed that I did not receive the support that I was promised, and also with the lack of uh, women in leadership on this board, I am willing to continue our work together uh, to make sure our programs are competitive and Bloomfield students um, can thrive. Uh, our students deserve our undivided attention um, you know, without having their education politicized. Um, so I'm hoping we can all just come together and, and work as a team. Uh, for the past 10 years, I worked collaboratively with uh, Bloomfield principals, teachers, staff, and students. And I'm excited to continue the work with or without a title and I'm committed to helping our students reach their full potential. Um, and I'll end with a quote. It is not titles that honor men, but men that honor titles, Machiavelli. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Mr. Moore. <clears throat> You're muted, Mr. Moore. Can you hear me? Now we hear you, yes. Okay, I just basically want to say um, congratulations to people that got elected tonight. Also, I want to thank the presenters who did an excellent job presenting. And I'm looking forward to coming back to the building and holding our board meetings. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Ms. Bogle, ask the guy.
You're muted. muted You're muted. So huh? You're muted. Okay, so I'm now on mute. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I'm looking forward to our new year together. Congratulations to the uh, new executive board. Of course, we still have the same chair, but that's fine. Um, I was happy to hear more about the uh, enrichment program. I really cannot wait to see how that plays out in our Bloomfield school system. Uh, thank uh, the superintendent and the chair for uh, introducing that initiative into, and again, I'm assuming that you, you participated in that, initi that initiative in, into the town. Again, uh, thank all of the teachers and the administrators for their very hard work as we come to the close of the year. Again, looking forward to working together for the next year to make sure that our children are successful. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wilkerson. Yes, I, I want to thank you, um, say thank you to all of the um, to all the young people that came up and that presented before the board. I think they did a phenomenal job. Um, also, you know, I, I was glad to hear about the gifted and talented program. I think that it's, uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful um, and encouraged with um, what's to come from that. And also want to congratulate you, Don, um, on your achievement. Um, I, I will also say that, you know, I'm also um, grateful to the voters um, who elected me to serve the four-year term here on the Board of Education. Um, and also thank uh, many of the board members who ex extended themselves to be friendly um, to me on my entry on the board. Um, I do want to say uh, that this is not about, you know, it's not about selfish gain, um, but it's always been about selfless service to Bloomfield. Um, as the governing body for the Bloomfield schools, uh, we are going to make some decisions that I know are going to be unpopular maybe in some times, but uh, we weren't elected to be popular. We were elected to serve the best interest of our students. Um, in that context, I do look forward to serving as board secretary. Um, I look forward to strengthening collaborations with our town council, um, building strong partnerships with community initiatives and projects in our town, uh, strengthening relationships with Creck and Cave, and garnering impactful uh, educational opportunities for our students to positively elevate their futures. Um, as you know, our model is raising the bars, taking us far. Um, in my opinion, it's not just a statement. It's a strategy model. It's a call to action. Uh, this won't be easy, but I'm up for the challenge. And I look forward to serving all stakeholders for the Bloomfield School District. And I hope my colleagues will work together to ensure that our children's educational experience is next to none. Um, so thank you again for having me here. And um, I look forward to a great term. Thank you. Mr. Friedman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me say, welcome back, Mr. Chairman. It's always been a pleasure working with you and I appreciate your leadership all these years and also your mentorship. So congratulations to you on being reelected as chairperson. I also want to um, congratulate um, our new member, Joseph Wilkerson. It's, um, I look forward to working with you and um, discussing our education here in Bloomfield and making Bloomfield the best school district um, and a prized education system here in Bloomfield. Um, I'm also very happy that, that we are one of the very few towns that are having COVID clinics for our young people. And I wanna make sure that um, our families are aware of it and take advantage of these clinics. So um, anything we can do to get the information out, we're more than happy to, uh, to help out with that as well. Um, Lastly, uh, as this is the season of thanks, uh, I want to thank Dr. Thompson and your staff. You make our job on the Board of Education so much easier. Um, so thank you, Dr. Thompson, your, 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 all your staff, from Krista to Stacy McCann to Stan Simpson. I thank you very much. And lastly, I want to wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Freiman. Um, I also want to send out my uh, congratulations to everybody who was elected, and that's from the council uh, to the library board. 
all, everybody in between. Those were both ends of the spectrum for their um, voting ballot. Um, you know, and I congratulate everybody because you all worked hard and you're here to serve uh, all of the people of the town of Bloomfield. We here on the Board of Ed are committed to serving the children. And uh, as I have done in my 39 years as a teacher and an administrator, and uh, my four years on the council and the last 10 years here on the board, um, I will continue to give my all, regardless of what position I am in, um, on behalf of the children. Um, special congratulations goes out to our new mayor, um, Danielle Wong, our new deputy mayor, um, Greg Davis, as well as the rest of the uh, town council. Uh, we have to work with them uh, to, as Dr. Thompson and staff are beginning to put together a budget that we will see uh, at the, sometime in 2022. Um, we're gonna have to work with them. And uh, again, for, to do for the betterment of the town of Bloomfield. And finally, uh, this is a season uh, of thanks. And uh, I want to extend my wishes for a happy Thanksgiving to all. Don't eat too much turkey and uh, enjoy yourself. At this point, Mr. Ike. So moved. So moved. Is there second. a second? Second. Second. Okay. We are adjourned. Thank you. Okay.